at it after that break, however long your break was, I have no idea. Uh, mine was short. Uh, so we left off here. Uh, we didn't get to this slide, but this is where we are. The overall view of Columbus, and more importantly, the Spanish, or Europeans, uh, more generally, of native peoples. Professor Taylor says Columbus unilaterally declared the natives subject to the Spanish crown, uh, which is uh, to say, you see the also melodramatic picture of Columbus on the left here kneeling down, but uh, he just assumed that since uh, we're Spanish or European, everybody that lives here uh, already, Native Americans, uh, are now under the control uh, uh, of the King of Spain. So uh, this is sort of the first of many uh, you know, racist actions and beliefs, uh, uh, beliefs of superiority by Europeans uh, and beliefs, be belief of the inferiority of uh, Native Americans. Uh, so this sets the tone, uh, which uh, you know, sadly lasts uh, uh, for centuries uh, after this. Um, he goes on to say, uh, col the colonial enterprise arrived in the Americas in Columbus's mind. Uh, from the start, uh, he treated the Caribbean islands uh, as their inhabitants. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, treated the Caribbean islands and their inhabitants as places and people to be rendered into commercial plantations worked uh, by forced labor. He rationalized that such treatment would benefit the Indians by exposing them to Christian salvation and Hispanic civilization. So he's saying they're going to be our workers, that's what they're supposed to do, uh, and it'll be good for them anyway. Uh, Christopher Columbus himself uh, uh, talked about uh, the peoples that he, you know, came across in one island after another in the Caribbean. So very, uh, talks, called them so very cowardly that a thousand would not stand against three armed Spaniards. And so they are fit to be ordered about and made to work, plant, uh, and do everything else that may be needed. So uh, he's, he's basically saying they're so inferior, they deserve to be or ordered around and bossed around and abused. Uh, so uh, this is the start uh, of uh, enormous cruelty uh, and destruction uh, on the part of Europeans uh, uh, at uh, or towards native peoples. Right about this time, uh, another Portuguese explorer and seafarer uh, made a, an incredible uh, voyage, the first circumnavigation of the globe. And you can see the, the route and the little blue line there on the screen. But, uh, by the way, Magellan didn't make it the whole way. Uh, he died in the Philippines, so he only made it about halfway uh, from uh, Europe uh, to and back to Europe again around the world. But I guess if you're a you know, uh, sea captain, uh, if you're the you know commander, uh, you get credit for something, even if you only do it halfway. Um, truth be told, only a handful of his uh, sailors crew made it back alive um, uh, from a much larger number than it started out uh, a few years before but we still refer to it as Magellan's circumnavigation of the globe because uh, he was the the, the big name uh, on board at least half of the way the only reason I'm mentioning it here uh, because it's right at the time uh, that Spain uh, starts to uh, you know sort of uh, uh, increase the size of its New World Empire by leaps and bounds. Uh, but this voyage shows that uh, at first the Portuguese uh, and Spanish, uh, but uh, it, it's foreshadowing, I guess, uh, not only uh, Europe going kind of around the world uh, and forcing its will on just about everybody else, uh, but also uh, what we now refer to as globalization. Uh, going around the world by, in, you know, by ship for the first time uh, is kind of a symbol uh, of uh, more uh, such uh, you know, things to follow. Uh, so uh, I mention this uh, because it gives us, again, some context to understand how far the Europeans are able to reach out from Europe, uh, and increasingly so from this point forward. The Europeans started to hear about uh, one empire, uh, Native American empire, uh, in the Americas, uh, Columbus's you know, troops, uh, Spanish soldiers, even after Columbus was uh, not in the picture any longer, and back, went to Spain, eventually died. Uh, and then uh, the Incan culture uh, was learned about a little bit later on. At first, they just heard, kind of heard rumors about these cultures, uh, uh, but they were curious, or at least some among the Spanish, as we'll see, were curious. And uh, what they were told, which they didn't know was true at the time, 
uh, was probably by and large true because the Aztec Empire uh, was spectacular, as it says here. Uh, just the uh, dazzling. Uh, the, uh, the buildings, and you can see models and drawings of the buildings here. The architecture was uh, gigantic, uh, monumental architecture, uh, you know, mon uh, temples uh, for worship, uh, nobles and uh, emperors, uh, you know, uh, palaces, etc., etc. By the way, the temples uh, and worship did include uh, human sacrifice, uh, which the Aztecs are known for. Uh, more on that later on. There was a marketplace uh, that seemed to go on forever as one of Columbus's own, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Cortez, we're going to get to Cortez in it, uh, one of his own soldiers uh, uh, noted uh, that you can sort of buy anything in this market uh, uh, in Tenochtitlan, the capital, which is where Mexico City is now. There, It was on an island, uh, and there were a number of causeways you can see in the map in the upper right, uh, which were you know engineering uh, you know feats uh, in and of themselves. Uh, Michael Mann in his book says Tenochtitlan dazzled its invaders, meaning the Spanish. It was bigger than Paris. The Spaniards gawped uh, like yokels at the wide streets, ornately carved buildings and markets bright with goods from hundreds of miles away. Boats flitted like butterflies around the three grand causeways. Long aqueducts uh, conveyed water from distant mountains. And we could go on and on and on. So the Spanish were bowled over uh, by this big time. Uh, it, it didn't stop them from uh, wanting to destroy it and, and take it down and loot it. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, they, they were impressed uh, uh, by what they saw. They were shocked at what they saw because they had been you know, brought up with the idea that Europeans are superior to everybody else, and they still believed that, uh, even after they saw this, uh, though you'd think they, you'd think they would have uh, you know, rethought that, uh, but racism never makes sense in the end anyway. Uh, it's always irrational. Uh, so uh, uh, the Aztec Empire was indeed uh, an, an, impre an impressive one. And so was the uh, Inca's empire uh, to the south. Uh, this uh, was a huge chunk of territory, basically the whole western part of South America. The map there shows in the middle kind of an orange center. Uh, those are the kind of the homeland areas of the Incas, uh, and the, the yellow around it, sort of up and down, north and south from it, uh, are the areas that they conquered. Uh, and both empires the Aztec and the Inca uh, became powerful and wealthy uh, by conquering their neighbors uh, by bloody force. Uh, once again, Michael Mann says, uh, in 1491, the Inca ruled the biggest empire on earth, uh, uh, 14, uh, bigger than the Ming dynasty in China, bigger by far than any European state. Uh, the empire encompassed every imaginable type of terrain. Uh, goes on to say there, that they had huge ambitions basically to conquer all of South America. Uh, and if other events hadn't have, you know, sort of gotten in the way, they may very well have done so. But Europeans, uh, when Spanish, when they came in contact uh, with this empire after hearing rumors about it, uh, uh, they must have also been uh, uh, you know, just uh, stupefied uh, by how impressive it was. Uh, fabulous architecture, a, a vibrant ceremonial culture, uh, a sort of great power uh, wielded, uh, lots of wealth. So uh, uh, the rumors uh, ended up being true. Uh, and one of the first guys to hear uh, such rumors whoops, uh, was this guy, Hernan Cortez, a junior officer uh, in the Spanish military stationed on the island of Cuba. The Spanish were already uh, uh, colonizing Cuba as well. And uh, he was from a lower noble family in Spain, so nobility, but not one of the you know the top noble noble families. Uh, he had been trained as a lawyer. Uh, uh, was a, a lower officer, fairly young. Uh, he, he was brilliant, charismatic. For we we think, uh, but also like Columbus, uh, sort of ambitious, ruthless, uh, 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 cruel. And he led what really was an unauthorized expedition in 4, 1519, uh, uh, partly due to the stories he heard. Uh, of empire, uh, and one specifically that he was told, if you just go across from Cuba, west across the Gulf of Mexico, and hit land, there's this gigantic, fabulously wealthy empire, 
uh, teeming with wealth uh, uh, that uh, you know, uh, and that of course piqued his curiosity, uh, uh, and uh, so he had, he kind of had permission to go on this trip. Uh, and got several hundred uh, 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 Spanish troops, a few hundred Spanish troops to go uh, with himself in command. And his goal, of course, wasn't just to visit and be uh, impressed by the beauty uh, and the, the riches. Uh, it was to take them. Uh, and so uh, this uh, is what uh, he uh, you know, heard when he uh, heard about the, the splendors of the Aztec Empire. So we're going to talk about why uh, or how the uh, Aztec uh, and Incan empires, which were not only wealthy, they were powerful. Uh, they had uh, the emperors of both these empires had powerful military forces at their disposal. Uh, and in both cases, a relative handful of Spanish soldiers, uh, you know, led by first uh, Cortes, we just met, uh, and later Pizarro, who took down the Incan empire uh, 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 through force, over through these empires. How? Uh, well, we're talking about four things here. Uh, and these are the four uh, big ones. The fourth one is a little bit uh, more uh, up in the air. Not entirely clear this was true, uh, but it appears to be. The first three uh, are definitely main reasons uh, why, uh, or how, I should say how, the Aztecs and Incans went down. Now, for reasons of time, I'm condensing the reasons, the explanations for how this happened together into sort of one uh, uh, right, list of explanations. And if we wanted to get more detailed, and we don't need to, uh, uh, and to be you know absolutely accurate, uh, I could, I, I sh uh, would give you different uh, explanations for the Aztec uh, uh, you know demise uh, from the uh, you know, differences in the Incan demise. But these are uh, uh, close enough here that we can uh, conflate them, bring them together. The impact of disease, uh, uh, you maybe already gasped before we got to this slide. As soon as Cortez's uh, group, uh, their ships uh, hit the east coast of what's now Mexico, uh, within, uh, I think, a week, there was already an outbreak of uh, smallpox uh, and spread inland uh, from there. So the Aztecs were already weakened uh, by smallpox before Cortez even arrived, uh, which Cortez and his guys had brought with them. Again, not intentionally, but uh, it certainly benefited them uh, in the long run. And Spanish soldiers died as well, but we already know the Europeans didn't die from these diseases as much because they were already used to them. Uh, so uh, more or a larger percentage of Aztec warriors uh, did die from this than you know, the soldiers that Cortes brought. Uh, so one of the explanations is that both of these empires were weakened uh, by the diseases that Europeans brought just before they got attacked by them. Cortez and Pizarro after him figured out quickly that the, na the, the neighbors of the Aztecs and Incas hated them. Uh, why? Because they'd been conquered by them by brute force. Nobody really likes to be conquered and, uh, and then uh, under the thumb of somebody else and told what to do all the time. These are uh, what are sometimes referred to by scholars as the tributary peoples. Uh, uh, so uh, Tenochtitlan, you see there, the Incan, I'm sorry, the, the Aztec heartland is the gold area. The tan area around it is the, the area they conquered that became part of the empire by, by military, violent military conquest. So the tributary states are various tribes, Native Americans, uh, uh, who were uh, uh, subdued by force. Uh, and so uh, this uh, uh, you know, wasn't taken well. As Francis Jennings says, uh, the conquered tributary peoples greatly resented having to send their own people for sacrifice on foreign temples. Uh, they were losing a lot of manpower in a land where all wealth depended on human labor. Thus, when Cortez and his men arrived, in 1519, the situation was ready-made for them to gain allies by exploiting accumulated resentment. So Cortez oriented himself and talked to, you know, many of these uh, uh, tribes and figured out quickly they hated the Aztecs. So, uh, right, didn't take, I think, too much arm twisting, no arm twisting, to say, hey, uh, I have a plan. We're going to go into Tenochtitlan, the Aztec capital, and we're going to take it down by force. Are you guys in? Uh, heck yeah, we're in. So uh, uh, this is the 
one of the soft underbellies of empire, uh, and that is that people hate you <laughs> because of it. And those kind of resentments don't usually go away. They last sometimes for you know uh, generation after generation. So uh, the fact that Cortez started with a few hundred men uh, doesn't mean he ended with that uh, because he got uh, a, a huge augment, uh, augmentation to his force uh, of uh, allied Native Americans. So that's sort of explanation number two. The third one uh, is more well known, the weapons technology advantage. The Spanish uh, had weapons that the uh, Aztecs and the Incas couldn't compete with. They did have some guns, both cannons uh, and what we now call rifles or muskets, uh, early versions of them, but they didn't have that many of them. Uh, and they were they were fairly, inact fairly inaccurate, but they did still give the Spanish, uh, you know, one uh, of a number of technological advantages here. I think the bigger one is steel. Spanish had steel swords and steel armor, you know, breastplates of armor and uh, 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 you know, uh, steel uh, helmets, etc., which Native American uh, bows and arrows and spears you know, couldn't penetrate. Uh, so stuff just bounced off of them, which gave them, of course, a gigantic advantage. The Spanish brought crossbows with them too, which were a pretty fearsome weapon to have to deal with that the you know uh, Aztecs and Inc Incas couldn't match as well. Uh, they had a few horses, which was an advantage also, uh, but uh, guns plus the steel uh, you know weapons uh, and uh, armor that sort of made this pretty one-sided, even uh, if and when the Spanish and their allies were outnumbered. Fourth, this is the one that's a little more iffy. Uh, native uh, religious beliefs, uh, Aztec and then Incan in this case, uh, uh, may have caused uh, them to stall and sort of be kind of confused and sort of you know, kind of put them off balance. Uh, because uh, it, it appears that since these people had never been seen before, uh, you know, compared to Native Americans, uh, the Spanish are these sort of pasty skinned. Uh, uh, white guys uh, and never seen them before. And there was a fear or a belief among some that they might be gods uh, or uh, one of them is a god or sent by uh, the gods. Uh, particularly it was feared that uh, Cortez himself might have been the god Quetzalcoatl, uh, the kind of most uh, feared god in the uh, Aztec pantheon of gods. And it didn't help that in some of the religious artwork in Aztec society, Quetzalcoatl was pictured with a beard, and the Spanish uh, nobility, uh, uh, it was fashionable for them to wear beards, and Cortez had a beard. So uh, it's quite possible that they didn't, they were kind of taken aback, the Aztecs, when they saw these guys, maybe particularly Cortez and maybe some of the other officers, wait, wait a minute, this, this, we don't know who these guys are, they might be gods. So I think they were probably trying to figure it out. They might not have been convinced. The emperor of the Aztecs, the last as it would be, Montezuma II, uh, probably was sort of stalling for time, trying to buy time as they figured out what to do. Because it, you can't attack gods, especially your own. Uh, right? Uh, nobody's going to do that. I mean, if they believe in the gods, they're not going to attack somebody that they think is sent by the gods or actually are the gods in, in, their, in their mind. So, uh, but... In, and the same thing more or less happened uh, to the south uh, 10 years later uh, when Pizarro uh, went to, uh, you know, uh, to Peru uh, and uh, conquered the Incan Empire. But the, how did this sort of you know, uh, play a role in what happened? The stalling uh, probably hurt them. Had uh, Montezuma, for instance, you know, immediately sent a force out to... Uh, intercept Cortez's before he even got close to Tenochtitlan, uh, and maybe ambush them or something. The the this might have gone differently, but because uh, he appears to have stalled and waited, because maybe they were trying to figure out, uh, you know, who these guys were, just mortals uh, that we can attack and kill, or gods. Uh, in that, uh, you know, uh, in the interim, uh, it gave the advantage, I think, to the Spanish. So uh, the Spanish, I guess I said, they were impressed uh, uh, by uh, what they saw. 
uh, and uh, you know, Montezuma did then uh, rule over a mighty uh, and impressive kingdom indeed. This is a rundown, uh, and it comes from the textbook, so I'm not going to go through it. You can go back and find it on your own, but it would be worth studying. I have a little uh, mini study guide for you here on this, but it does give you kind of the chronological events, uh, the process, the series of events by which eventually Cortes uh, took his troops into the center of Tenochtitlan and utterly destroyed it. Uh, and, and the Spanish basically burned it to the ground, uh, tore it to pieces, and then built a Spanish style city on top of what had been a, an Aztec style city, which is the city that became Mexico City. Here's Francisco Pizarro, uh, also a uh, one of the first conquistadors, means conquerors, also brutal and greedy. Uh, Alan Taylor says, a ruthless brutality that might have shamed even Cortez. Yikes, uh, that's scary. He conquered the Incas, uh, the Incas with only 180 soldiers, less than Cortez had. Uh, he came from a, a sort of obscure background, unlike Cortez, who uh, had come from a, at least a you know somewhat or a low noble uh, background. Uh, but they did have certain things in common. By the way, Cortez. Let, let's go, go back for a second. I don't like you staring at a slide. Uh, you get distracted, I know, because everybody does uh, if I'm talking about something else. But Cortes became the wealthiest person in Spain uh, uh, through his conquests, at least in time. And he was sort of disobeying orders, uh, but he gambled uh, and sort of thought, thought about it uh, correctly, as it turned out, that even if I disobey orders, as long as I succeed and take a bunch of wealth with me, and give a lot of it to the king and queen of Spain, they won't care. Uh, and sure enough, uh, that's what happened. So uh, Pizarro is basically trying to produce uh, the same result uh, just in another empire further to the south in the Americas that had also been based on sort of these stories, myths, that end up much of it being true in this case. And we already kind of know how it happened because I've brought the, the, the causes that are similar or the same together. This is also a brutal conquest, uh, which tells us a great deal about Spanish uh, motives. The emperor was captured. By the way, Montezuma had been captured and was killed by his own people in a civil war, kind of freaked out over everything that was happening around them. We don't, we're not sure exactly how he was killed, but he did die in the process. Atahualpa was captured by the Spanish uh, and held for ransom. And in this room uh, uh, was not where he was kept, but the, a deal was struck between the Spanish officers, Pizarro at their head, uh, and the you know movers and shakers, the nobility uh, in uh, the Incan Empire, uh, it, by which the agreement was if the uh, Incas fill up this entire room, like to the top, with gold and silver and precious metals and wealth and money, uh, uh, then they'll let the emperor go. Uh, and you can see the dimensions of the uh, the room here. And yet, even though the Incas lived up to their end of the bargain, the Spanish executed at Halpa anyway. In 1533, uh, Michael Mann saying, uh, when Atahalpa fulfilled his half of the bargain, rather than releasing him, they garroted him. Uh, and Certainly, this is an act of treachery and great inhumanity. I'm not denying that for a second. Uh, but the Spanish probably believed, after the fact, they, they I mean, it, it's possible that they meant to kill him, uh, uh, you know, and they were going to do that from the beginning. I don't know that for a fact. Uh, it could be true. But I think it's possible that they hadn't planned to do that originally, but once this got underway, uh, and they'd already made sort of the, the promise, hey, you, you know, give us all this money, we'll let your guy go. Uh, it's still kidnapping and ransoming, uh, still a crime. Uh, but they may have thought, if we let him live and let him go now, he's going to be a rallying point uh, for opposition against us uh, that you know, could cause this whole thing to, uh, you know, our project to collapse. Uh, so, uh, again, keep in mind, I'm not telling you this was the, the right thing to do from a moral perspective. It was not. 
but I'm trying to get you to, to see uh, what the Spanish thinking was on this, whether right or wrong. Uh, you know, this is brutal. Uh, but uh, uh, just so we understand uh, what the Spanish uh, may have been doing here. So why were they really there? Uh, well, you can see from these two pictures. Uh, on the left, a beautiful uh, work of art that uh, one of them that survived, because that's obviously, you know, today, a photograph in a museum somewhere, I don't know where. Uh, but most of the this type of uh, incredible artwork, you know, uh, showing the, the, the you know, artistic culture uh, of the, the, the advanced artistic culture of the Incas, uh, most of it was just burned down uh, uh, or, or uh, melted down into gold coins, like immediately. So the Spanish uh, uh, were not interested in Incan culture, uh, and these two photos next to each other show it. If they were, they would have put that sort of in a careful box and wrapped it, and uh, even if they're going to steal it, uh, send it back home carefully to put in a museum in Madrid uh, somewhere. But they were ab about the money. Uh, so all of this uh, uh, is very nasty, uh, uh, and you know the what what can we say uh, except that it was brutal, nasty. Uh, it uh, uh, you know was uh, uh, just the beginning of European exploitation and destruction of Native American uh, societies. In time, other conquistadors uh, and other Spanish uh, leaders officially, unofficially, uh, started to explore more and more uh, to the north uh, even of Mexico or Mexico City uh, and to the south of uh, Peru and to the south of Lima. Uh, and you can see here in this map then the Spanish New World Empire at its fullest extent. Uh, all the areas in pink uh, uh, eventually came under Spanish domination and control. That's a gigantic empire. In terms of uh, geography and population size, it's enormous. Uh, so, and, and this caused European countries, the English, the French, the Dutch, uh, to get nervous because they thought they're just going to keep going, and if they, if they, you know, swallow up two whole continents, they're going to be so rich and so powerful, they're going to conquer us. Uh, and the, the Spanish, in a sense, kind of tried. In 1588, they sent the Spanish Armada, famously uh, from Spain, uh, into the English Channel. Uh, Philip II, King of Spain, had at least some notions uh, of kind of conquering or at least controlling uh, England. They met with incredibly bad luck uh, and staunch uh, English naval resistance, and so the Spanish Armada failed. Uh, but uh, it wasn't unthinkable. The, the Europe, other European countries weren't being paranoid when they thought, oh my God, we cannot allow Spain uh, to you know, swallow up all of the Americas. They already have like half of it uh, uh, as is. Uh, so uh, the empire was so big, it had to be split into four administrative districts, uh, four kind of governors or viceroys, they're called. So the Viceroyalty of New Spain uh, and the three uh, further to the south in, into what's now South America. Uh, so uh, this uh, was an incredibly uh, large uh, and fantastically successful, albeit uh, uh, you know inhumane uh, and brutally violent conquests. Conquistadors, uh, uh, there were many of them after news spread that you know, Cortez had struck it rich and Pizarro uh, and hit sort of the jackpot. Uh, then everybody uh, in Spain uh, that's you know got a you know high position in society wants in on this, and soldiers too that come from a low position in society. Uh, an average soldier could do well uh, also uh, if they survived uh, and uh, you know followed orders. Uh, when they were done, they probably got or they did sometimes get located on a piece of land uh, somewhere in Mexico or somewhere in the New World, not back in Spain but a, a more sizable piece of land than they would ever been able to afford in Spain. So it was it could be a pretty good deal even for just an average foot soldier. Um, permission to explore and plunder. Uh, and in a sense, the officers gave the men uh, this permission uh, because there's another uh, perk that they got uh, was that, to, you know, you follow orders and do all the dirty work here, and you can just kind of fill your pockets uh, when we go through, uh, you know, one Native American uh, town or, you know, a settlement after another. Uh, to be a conquistador, as Professor Taylor says, greed was virtually a prerequisite. I love that phrase. 
Uh, and it really was. Think about it. Uh, some just sort of guy, laid back guy in Spain. Uh, you know, I don't have a lot of money, but I don't really need money and wealth and power. I'm, I'm happy. Uh, what the hell is he going to go over there for? You only go, uh, 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 you know, sort of on, on one of these uh, uh, trips uh, if you have incredible ambition uh, and greed uh, and ruthlessness uh, because it's just not worth it otherwise. Uh, and though the Native Americans certainly suffered way, way, way more, uh, this still wasn't pleasant work, you know, sort of on the move all the time, uh, eating terrible food and, uh, you know, having to sort of, uh, you know, plow on, uh, uh, you know, mile after mile in you know, terrible weather, uh, in terrible conditions. And, and for what? Well, I'm going to get really rich and powerful. Okay. Uh, uh, it wouldn't be to my taste, that's for sure. Uh, I'd rather just be that guy that stayed home and say, you guys can go. I'm, I'm cool. I'm cool here. Uh, uh, so you had to be uh, uh, pretty hardcore uh, to even uh, want to go uh, and do this. Finding riches uh, uh, just over the horizon or the other Mexico, which means the other Aztec empire. Remember I said that there were a couple, there were lots of stories uh, floating around, two of which end up being true. Uh, the Aztec Empire, uh, you know, this empire to the west of Cuba is teeming with wealth and uh, uh, you know, really big and powerful, and the Incan as well. Uh, and with both of those being true, it kind of caused the rest of the conquistadors that came afterwards to assume that every story they heard like this was also true. And the Spanish they ended up being somewhat unlucky in, in that way uh, because uh, that was incredibly misleading. They had been two for two, uh, but... Uh, that then caused a lot of assumptions to be made. Let's say only one of the two of those had been true. Let's say when Pizarro went to, you know, uh, to Peru uh, and Bolivia to check out the Incas, uh, he found out they're not rich and powerful. That was a that was a BS story. It was a myth, uh, right? Then the Spanish would have had, I think, a better idea of uh, you know uh, what they were confronting. But because they were two for two, uh, now you've got all these conquistadors that are going far and wide in the Americas trying to find kind of the next, uh, uh, you know, Tenochtitlan. Uh, and they were hearing stories that were uh, that they were there. But none of the other stories ended up being true. None of them were correct. Uh, and so one of the explanations, only one, of that how that sprawling empire that we just saw on the map came to be, uh, how it got so big is that you guys like this conquistadors and their troops uh, going uh, you know far out because they heard you know into say what's now New Mexico in, in the United States because right? they heard there was a, a, a powerful mighty rich empire there that was sort of uh, there for the taking uh, and so uh, partly the Spanish extended their empire by going out on these wild goose chases all over the place many of the most famous conquistadors uh, you know uh, uh, Ponce de Leon uh, and, and de la Salle and others became famous mainly because of things that they discovered, uh, landmarks and, and things. Uh, that's not what they wanted to be famous for. Uh, they wanted to be famous for the reason that Cortez was, uh, because he became fabulously wealthy uh, and uh, uh, you know, somewhat powerful uh, because of it. Uh, but uh, so one historian has said, uh, this is called this riches just over the horizon. It's kind of like a mirage in the desert. Uh, oh, I see water over there. Just keep going close. I, that, wait a minute, it's not, that's wrong. Then you keep going and you see water again. So uh, they're being sent on these uh, fool's errands in a sense because they're believing stories. And you can see why they would uh, since uh, the first two had been correct uh, that just uh, uh, don't pan out. In time, the Spanish uh, realized that they were sitting on a gold mine, literally, uh, actually gold and silver mines, and more silver than gold, uh, but silver uh, is still uh, very, very valuable, was very valuable as well. And they extracted then uh, over the next number of decades throughout the rest of the 16th century an enormous amount of gold and silver, uh, stealing it uh, from uh, mainly of uh, a, a mine in a place called Zacatecas, Mexico, uh, and one uh, in uh, uh, in Bolivia, uh, and uh, so uh, this was the uh, was easy money, or sometimes called the the, the uh, resource curse, which has its ups and downs, as you can see here. The Spanish galleon on the right, uh, the Spanish would sort of take regular uh, shipments. 
uh, of the gold and silver, uh, fairly regular, uh, uh, back to, to, to Spain. And uh, oftentimes under, uh, you know, armed guard by, you know, warships around them because uh, guess who attacked them? Pirates. Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, that's that's what those movies are about. I mean, they're very fictionalized and romanticized, but the English, the Dutch, the French uh, sent their pirates or privateers uh, to prey on the, the ships that they knew were laden uh, with this uh, huge treasure uh, and, and wealth. Why do we call this the easy money uh, uh, curse? Or uh, the more scholarly way to say it is the resource curse. Uh, well, I'm not saying it was you know totally easy. Uh, uh, they had to conquer first, and the uh, the Aztecs and the Incas uh, didn't exactly uh, welcome them, make it easy for them. They put up a fight, uh, but. Relatively speaking, uh, the money came uh, easier than it does in say, other parts of the Americas. When we get to the English colonies, we'll see they were trying for this uh, and assuming there'd be gold and silver, uh, and there wasn't. So they had to sort of work harder to eke out, uh, in the, you know, uh, not just an existence, but then eventually prosperity over a longer term. It was much harder work over a much longer time. So by comparison, this was like winning the lottery. Uh, or you know, hitting the jackpot uh, at you know in uh, Reno or Las Vegas, uh, so this is what is meant by easy money. Uh, it's usually when a resource is exploited. Uh, think like oil in the modern world. If you're one of those countries that you know happen to be sitting on uh, a huge uh, in a reservoir of oil, uh, just when oil became valuable on the on world markets, uh, then uh, right uh, your country uh, became extremely wealthy uh, overnight. Uh, just based on one uh, resource in some cases. So uh, the Spanish stealing of gold and silver from the Americas uh, made them incredibly wealthy overnight. And they were already becoming a powerful kingdom uh, and state uh, in, in Europe, uh, but this just put them sort of over the top. Uh, and mainly because of this empire, uh, and more specifically that gold and silver uh, being extracted regularly, uh, uh, Spain became the, the, the most powerful country uh, in Europe for the rest of the 16th century, even somewhat into the, the 17th century, uh, and maybe even in the world. It's harder to sort of uh, compare power uh, around the world, a little bit easier to do if we're just talking about Europe. Either way, they were very powerful because of this. The kings of Spain that were sort of, uh, that presided over this uh, sort of, uh, you know, robbery and heist uh, of enormous amounts of loot uh, from the New World, uh, uh, at, you know, at its height, were Charles V and Philip II, father and father and son, uh, very famous uh, kings in European history. Uh, but they, in a sense, squandered it. Not just their faults, uh, but this is where we were talking about the easy money or resource curse. When money comes in this way, it's easy to get kind of... Uh, addicted to it and sort of take it for granted. But if it's based on a resource, we know resources are finite. Uh, and so uh, th there were plenty of uh, leaders in Spain, particularly these guys' own financial advisors, uh, who were saying all along, you've got to take some of this gold and silver and reinvest it in long-term productive enterprises, uh, right? manufacturing of this or that, uh, so that when the resources, the gold and silver run out, we can put it, we've already put it to long-term profitable use, and not much of this was done. Uh, this kept getting put off or sort of seen as not that important because we got we got tons of money. Uh, what are you talking about? We're fine. Uh, we don't have to manufacture things. We can just buy it with the gold and silver that we have. So much silver poured into Europe that it caused huge inflation. Uh, it's like you know printing more money uh, when, you know, when you shouldn't. Uh, so inflation. This this is such a huge, uh, you know, influx uh, of this, uh, you know, these valuable metals that it caused uh, inflation in Europe, Europe as a whole. Uh, so uh, Spain uh, sort of succumbed to the resource curse or easy money curse. I always sort of say it this way: If you're a young person, uh, or if you're if you're not like me, uh, uh, when you were a young person, if you win the lottery or won the lottery. Let's say you win fifty million dollars. Would your parents be happy about that? 
well, yeah, to a degree. They wouldn't tell you to give it back. I don't mind wouldn't have. Uh, you know, they just figured I'm going to get a nice, uh, you know, bigger home out of this and maybe a new car. And, uh, but they'd be concerned. And I know my parents would have been concerned if it was me at like 19 years old. Uh, because like, what, what the hell does he know? Uh, in order, he doesn't have enough maturity to handle fifty million dollars, uh, and they would have had a good point. Uh, in my, at least in my case, maybe not in yours, uh, but uh, so uh, right because you, you can just you could just play the rest of your life. You could just be lazy and sleep until uh, two a.m. or, or two p.m. every every day, at two a.m. Uh, right, and not learn the value of hard work. Not learn really the value of anything. Uh, you could you could have all that money and do nothing with your life uh, and sort of not lift a finger to help anybody else. Uh, that's not for sure. You might already be a well-grounded person and you could take that money and it just helps you to you know sort of live out the ambitions that you wanted and you still have a career. Uh, but you can see, I think, my point that it could derail a person early on in life uh, in a way that's actually not good for them, uh, even though it sounds contradictory. Uh, uh, or it's counterintuitive because, wait a minute, this person got really rich and you're saying it was bad for them? Yeah, kind of. Uh, and so this appears uh, to be able to happen to like an entire society, uh, in this case the Spanish. I can think of countries today that appear to me, though I'm not an expert on this, uh, to be kind of in the same position. Saudi Arabia always comes to mind. Uh, right? a, a country that's wealthy, at least the uh, royal family is wealthy, uh, and you know they've got oil money and huge, you know, like eight jets for one person. Why do you need eight jets? Uh, but as far as I can tell, uh, and again, I should you know, read more on this before I talk about it too much, uh, but it doesn't look like they're diversifying their economy for that day eventually uh, when oil uh, starts to run out uh, and dry up. Uh, where are they going to be then? Uh, this can happen, I think, to any people. I'm not saying it's something inherent to Spanish culture. It wasn't. Uh, so if the if it was the English that had gotten there first and taken the uh, you know by force the Aztec and Incan empires uh, and taken the money uh, 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 gold and silver they would have been uh, under the uh, you know threat of succumbing to the resource resource curse as well. So uh, it could hit any it could hit anybody. So am I saying that the Spanish were unlucky uh, uh, for uh, you know having this windfall of profit that uh, they turned into pa power? To a degree, I, I, I would say I would say yes. Uh, ended up being uh, unlucky in the long run. They squandered it so much. By the middle of the next century, they weren't they were not only the not the the uh, not Europe's number one power any longer. They were falling uh, fast uh, and never did sort of regain their status as even one of the uh, European powers. The one thing that they did do. The Spanish and the system they created in the New World uh, that was sort of long term in terms of profit was the encomienda system. Uh, so, this was the only long term kind of economic project. However, today we usually learn about it uh, because of the cruelty involved in it, because it did rely on uh, basically slave labor uh, of native peoples, uh, uh, you know, land taken from them. Again, maybe a Spanish officer who had to be paid off for his service gets a, a plantation, uh, and uh, he uh, then commandeers or forces uh, labor uh, out of Native peoples. So a brutal uh, and uh, you know, racist system as well. But at least from an economic standpoint, it's the only example really that the, the Spanish were thinking long-term economically in any way. The only thing that's sort of you know outside of the their uh, giving in to the resource curse. Catholic missionaries, lots of Catholic priests uh, there. Uh, eventually, they were, of course, trying to convert Native Americans to Catholicism. Uh, and Spain was a Catholic country. And most of them had uh, good intentions. You know, they, they were racists and believed that Europeans were superior. They, they assumed that their religion, Christianity, Catholicism was the only right one. Uh, Native American religions were wrong and incorrect. So uh, a lot of uh, sort of ideas of superiority of Europeans and the way they do things and, and assumptions of Native American inferiority, uh, which of course are quite ugly to us. And they should be. Uh, but the, the priests, I think, really, uh, at least you know, most of them, really believed that they were doing good. They may not have been, but they believed it. Uh, right, uh, all kinds of 
examples exist in history of someone that thought they were doing good when everybody else like, are you, are you kidding? Uh, 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 that's, that's a terrible thing to do. Uh, but remember that in the 16th century in Europe, just about everybody uh, believed in uh, heaven and hell as literal concepts. And so one of the, maybe the main way in which they believed that they were actually doing good by Native Americans uh, was that they're saying that if we convert them, they won't go to hell. Uh, if they become good uh, Catholics, then they'll get into heaven. Uh, if not, they'll burn uh, for eternity. Uh, right? Uh, that was the belief in Europe, uh, in uh, the Christian world, that if you go to hell, uh, you're going to be uh, sort of you know suffering, you know, for eternity, uh, which is a pretty long time. As my best friend says, uh, life is short, death is long. So if you believe that, uh, you know, in a literal hell, uh, and these priests did, uh, you can see how they would, uh, you know, think, uh, as silly as it might sound to most of us today, uh, that uh, we're doing good. Uh, otherwise, they're going, if they don't convert to Christianity and, and worship the wrong god or gods, they'll go to hell, uh, and uh, they'll suffer, they'll burn uh, for eternity. Uh, and there were some uh, Catholic priests uh, who sort of... Uh, went beyond that in their concern for Native Americans. Bartolome de las Casas, uh, who we'll talk more about in a second, said, what will they think of the Christian God, meaning Native Americans, and what will they think, uh, when they see their friends' heads split open and hands amputated? Uh, there was all kinds of brutal punishments uh, for Native peoples uh, in the Spanish Empire uh, for not sort of, uh, you know, doing their job, uh, at least to bringing in the you know, quota of gold and silver that was required of them. You know, we're going to cut off a hand if you don't bring in your quota. Uh, and so that's what Las Casas is referring to there, the brutality exhibited uh, you know, uh, upon Native peoples uh, uh, by the Spanish authorities. So he was a Spanish priest, but he was uh, uh, appalled at what the Spanish had done. Uh, Man says that Las Casas, uh, a conquistador, who repented of his actions and became a priest, spent the second half of his long life opposing European cruelty in the Americas. Uh, so he was one of the priests on the ground, though he was a pretty influential one, uh, and became even more so as he started to criticize uh, the Spanish conquistadors, the leaders, the policy, etc. Uh, in one of his writings, and he wrote voluminously diaries and a history of the Spanish involvement up until you know that time, uh, and his writings have survived. He's a major primary source of, for historians of, of great value. Uh, one of the passages, there are many passages like this in his writings, he said, the reader may ask himself if this is not cruelty and injustice of a kind so terrible that it beggars the imagination, and whether these poor people would not fare far better if they were entrusted to the devils in hell than they do at the hands of the devils of the New World uh, who masquerade as Christians. Uh, he, he's criticizing his own uh, uh, government, his own people, the Spanish. And what we're doing here is flat out immoral and wrong uh, and uh, 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 you know, horrendous. It beggars the imagination it's so terrible, he says. Uh, he wasn't the only one. Uh, they, were, uh, they were in the minority, uh, but there were some other priests that, you know, uh, thought the same. He was the most influential uh, and sort of vocal uh, of them. Uh, so uh, there were some Spanish uh, citizens, mostly priests, uh, who were, you know, uh, not pleased from a moral perspective with what the Spanish were doing to Native peoples. The Colombian Exchange sounds like some sort of drug deal movie or something, uh, but uh, it's more, a little more mundane than that though uh, uh, of enormous importance. Uh, and this is the exchange of flora and fauna, plants and animals, back and forth across the Atlantic uh, between the Old World and the New World, uh, Europe uh, the Americas. Uh, Taylor says, in effect, the post-Columbian exchange depleted people on one side of the Atlantic while swelling uh, those on the uh, European and Atlantic side. As you might have already guessed, the Europeans benefited more from this in the end uh, than the Native Americans. Uh, some of that was just bad luck, not all of it. If you count diseases as living things, which they technically are, then it was really one-sided in favor of Europeans. Uh, but Europeans got, uh, just from the picture, corn, tomato, and the potato. 
among the other ones on there, but I don't even mention those. Those three uh, foodstuffs, crops, didn't even exist in Europe before. Uh, it was only since then uh, that uh, Europe has had the advantage of them. Uh, interesting, because think of it now. We think of Italian food, and we think of you know tomato sauce, spaghetti sauce, other things, whatever. Uh, but before this, uh, no Italian uh, had sort of tomato sauce or tomato paste in any food because they didn't have the tomato. They didn't know the tomato. Uh, not only did it make their diet sort of more interesting, but it improved it considerably. Uh, so uh, this is one of the reasons that uh, life expectancy uh, went up and population rose in Europe uh, in the following centuries because their diet improved uh, because of the introduction of these and other crops taken or brought from the New World. Uh, so uh, on the other side, Native Americans uh, had to deal with livestock, uh, pigs, uh, and, and, uh, you know, cows, and you know, other livestock brought over by Europeans that didn't just spread disease, they also ruined the environment uh, in many places where they existed, trampled over Native Americans' uh, crops. and uh, So uh, a lot of things that went the other way uh, were detrimental. Weeds brought over by uh, Europeans you know, unintentionally on seeds and the you know buff foot, foot or boot of a conquistador uh, when he leaves uh, Spain uh, and uh, sets down in, you know, I don't know, uh, Mexico, uh, and that seed falls into the ground. Well, those weeds would decimate and did decimate uh, ecosystems uh, in the New World. Uh, well, you mean the New World didn't have weeds? No, they had weeds, but they had different kinds of weeds, different species of weeds, uh, which the plants in the New World uh, hadn't built up defenses against because they never dealt with those weeds before. Uh, and so they were quite vulnerable, much like the now, Native American people were vulnerable to diseases. Uh, their uh, uh, plants were as well uh, you know, when they had to come in contact with other uh, uh, foreign and new plants. It, it sounds odd to say for sure that weeds could have some impact on history, but indeed uh, uh, that is what I'm saying here. Uh, so the Columbian Exchange uh, certainly uh, was one-sided for the most part. Native Americans did get the reintroduction of the horse, uh, which proved very beneficial to some tribes. So there were a few things uh, beneficial. But the most important thing for us to remember, remember we're trying to understand uh, this, uh, these events, uh, is uh, this, that there was a global revolutionary impact. Uh, and we already kind of, in a sense, started with this. Remember that it was the Americas, this process, uh, that shifted the world economy, the center of the world economy, away from the Indian Ocean uh, and basically to Europe. Uh, and allowed uh, then uh, uh, the products uh, or the uh, uh, crops I just mentioned, uh, uh, some of which I didn't mention, uh, in a way, uh, right, that allowed Europeans to trade many commodities for the first time that were in great global demand, which corrected the earlier trade imbalance. If you remember, maybe you don't, uh, when we started this, the Portuguese go into the Indian Ocean, uh, right, with their guns out, armed trade. I said part of the reason is because there was a trade imbalance. The Europeans didn't have that much stuff that people from Asia wanted. That's all changed now because by stealing land, uh, by conquering Native American lands uh, and taking their resources uh, and uh, you know planting crops like sugar, coffee, tobacco, uh, you know, uh, and uh, you know, sending them back uh, to Europe and then on to Asia and other places. Now they have all kinds of things. Uh, uh, to trade and sell that other parts of the world want. Why didn't they just grow coffee and tobacco and sugar in Europe? Because the climate wasn't right for it. So now they own plantations from land that they've you know uh, taken by force uh, that allows them to uh, uh, produce and control and sell uh, uh, crops that everybody wants. I mean, tobacco, it's addictive. So is sugar and coffee really uh, are addictive as well. So uh, all of those products, plus the gold and silver and many other things, uh, now mean Europeans can and do go around the world uh, and have all kinds of items uh, uh, that are in great demand in other parts of the world. So the trade imbalance 
uh, is corrected. And it's a big part of explaining how the world economy shifted, uh, again, at center from uh, the Indian Ocean uh, to the Atlantic Ocean, basically Europe, uh, Africa, uh, who took the brunt of it, of course, because we'll get to the slave trade uh, as part of this, the ugliest part by far, uh, and the uh, colonists of one European country or another uh, in the New World.